This is Mud and Chrome, an Altered Carbon podcast. Today we are watching episode 3, In a Lonely Place. I'm Van Velding, I am so ready to start and then end this. 3, 2, 1, engage. Uh, as a status update, Altered Carbon has not gained back the trust that it lost in episode 2. I mean, I'll get to it, but... Boof. Hey, he's the snake. The snake's a guy. The guy's a snake. Uh, so here we are. In our little ouroboros dragony dragon -y worm. I guess it's a worm. If a dragon has no legs, it's a worm then. So. And the ouroboros has his own tail, but it doesn't do the kinky thing in the middle. So it's not an ouroboros. Or even a, uh, a brood there. So... Yeah, so we finally acknowledge that space is out there. We did that a little bit in the first episode. Um, but now we're finally going back to it to get uh, the history of of Kovacs and um, his sister, Sister Kovacs. I think it's important to try to get um, like a running total of cast members Um we seem to have given up on Kovac's sister as being dead already. So, she's not a candidate? I'm still going to consider her a candidate for future people until we see her die in a flashback. So, we got German guy, uh, lady who read the envoy, lady who led the envoys, Jesus. And, um... I think it's just those three from his past that we're worried about resurfacing to do stuff. Uh, any of which we assume are now meths. Uh, it would be weird if Bancroft was a meth. Um, it's so pointless how futuristic this children's book is. It's fascinating. Um, it's, it's interesting. The Patchwork Man, I mean... <laughs> I think this Frankenstein-like character might be some kind of a social allegory. It's weird, huh? Uh, we, I mentioned in the last episode how bodies are just uh, commodities that are chewed up in this series. And it does a good job of showing that. And the, the neo-mythology of the patchwork man uh, illuminates that perfectly. It's, it's a well-done story element. Which, of course, we know that, um, oh no, they were abused and their mom was abused and it's a sad house. It's, it's not that I object to the depiction of abuse. I'm sure this is a realistic picture for a lot of people. The, the sleeveless undershirt is a bit on the nose in terms of casting. Um, not casting, but you know what I'm saying. Framing up this classic domestic abuse guy in the domestic abuse shirt. Um, it, it feels stock, like it's a stock tragic background. Like Takeshi could just be a middle school student who struggled with math and then graduated high school and is like, oh, join the military, which we've still seen no flashback proof of. Um, did all these terrible black ops things for the government and then fell in with the envoys because it was a better way. We haven't seen none of that. He just has a sad life because Kovacs is so, so sad, so terrible. Anyway, um, here's Poe again. Always good to see Poe. Uh, went to Sun Touch House, which I guess I missed in the first episode that that's the name of where Bancroft lived. Um,. And then we kind of get this, like, right... This isn't, like, a... Uh, like, a background thing or a rumor. We immediately learn that this is happening. I guess so we can we can get the drama from it. So, um... So there's, like, an immediate consequence for this. Nothing down. Uh, Bancroft... I guess that that's the issue here. I'm trying to think of how this fits so weirdly with what we've seen so far. And a lot of that is 
uh, that Bancroft sets this thing up to help Kovacs do his job, but doesn't even bother to coordinate with him on that. Um, it's a good idea. Uh, it's a fantastic idea. And I think the only reason Kovacs is not more enthusiastic about it is because uh, he just wasn't told in advance. You know, people hate having things sprung on them. And then Bancroft was like, hey, I invited you 30 minutes ago. Why didn't you respond to my text, you fucking douchebag? Uh, right, and that that gets me confused. That is the thing which I do not get. Is fidelity a thing in this universe? I don't... It seems really quaint. Uh, again, I, I believe in fidelity. Um, but... At the same time, <laughs> yeah. So we get we get the psychotherapy too. Hey, there we go. Um, again, if Poe can learn how to do something like that so quickly um, and at such a low cost, unless he just bills the class to uh, Bancroft slash Kovacs, then why in the hell do computers not run this place? It's the same problem that Schlock Mercenary has, where if computers just go bloop 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 then what why why don't they know how to do everything and then have all the skills to do the things I can see obviously the issue where they cannot um, where they can't have the kind of uh, initiative there we go in planning that humans have they don't have the base desires to drive them into more grandiose schemes I mean I assume that you know, instead of food, shelter, security, uh, not not progeneration, not regeneration, procreation, there we go. Um, AIs are driven by whatever function that they serve in society and have an intrinsically limited view. Uh, Poe just wants to make Kovacs happy, for example, because he's a client. Um, right, so I'm kind of glossing over this scene because it's basically just the scaffolding to get her into this uh, adventure. Oh yeah, it is, it is fucking... Oh yeah, right. The Golden Gate Bridge, which we've seen a million times, tells us exactly where we are, which we knew for the entirety of the last episode. <laughs> oh yeah, that was Golden Gate Bridge. Alright. I, I have every reason to believe it was a crane, given that I forgot that we were in San Francisco. This guy again, he's pretty stupid, right? I mean... It's just like, this man's competence is 2d6 depending on the scene. Where he's just like, like, why do you get close enough to a guy with a pistol? Have you people not seen Kiss Kiss Bang Bang? It's it's a classic. And you're just going to get close enough to a guy with a pistol so you can grab it out of your hand. Ugh. Anyway. I, I was incredulous at this point in the episode because he's taking on more detective work it's like you're not even a good detective I mean why do you think that that's a thing so anyway uh, we get some explanation for this later I, I feel like Elliot has been chosen as the sidekick by the plot and therefore, everyone's kind of read the script and gone, alright, Elliot's going to be the sidekick. And so here we are, talking to Elliot. Who's not a bad character, actually. As this episode goes on, I, I come to like him a little more. He's got way more personality than Kovacs. I mean, Kovacs is a tortured hero with a dark past. Blah, 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 blah believer and lost his faith. And blah, 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 and get faith back in the envoys. And also, that faith comes with Kung Fu. So, fucking this guy... Um, not, not you, Elliot, you're fine. Um, there's that coffee again. Huh, I wonder if it's just a recurring element or if it's somehow part of something. I don't know. Um, this show works so hard to uh, weave its elements together to try to be a, a cohesive world that the recurrence of the coffee makes me wonder if these people just can't put up a fucking ad for the gap somewhere. You know what I mean? Where it's like, oh, in the future there's this coffee and then 
sex, tits, and then maybe coffee also, but still the tits, and then coffee. So I, I just don't know if, if it's myopia and just taking the one coffee design that your graphic designer made and using it to its max, or uh, if there's something deeper going on there. Um, I mean, put up a Nike ad, guys. Not Obviously not literally Nike. Don't don't argue the example. Just put up a, an ad for shoes, and then just put like a swoosh, not like the swoosh, but a swoosh, and be like, hey, get your fikies now. And then it's just like a happy person running. And then, you know, they're like in a field, and they're a happy person running in a field, but you live in like shitty future San Francisco. Um, so they're not really doing a great sales job here, but, um, Elliot's desperate and he, you know, Kovacs seems competent. <laughs> and he gives, because he's a Marine, remember, so he gives this entire Marine story and, uh, then he, then he rolls into a different story. He goes from allegorical story to straight up allegory to finally just giving us consent and letting us all get on with our lives. Um, I do like the limitations on Poe not being able to construe consent from a story. Also, because Elliot's always kind of sucked, um, you cannot um, make that threat. Elliot can't because he's not dangerous enough to bring down the building. He's just like puffing himself up. And I I I missed it earlier when fucking Kovacs is like, I'll do anything to get what I want, and that's why I'm gonna help your girl. And Elliot's like, okay. And I'm like, dude, you can't make a deal where you you enter into an in, into an exchange with a strict utilitarian because they will always renege on that deal if Doing so would help them more. You you enter into deals with people because they have an irrational sense of of honor or honesty or commitment. Um, even if it is to their disadvantage later, y- you want them to follow through on their deal to you because that's what they said they would do. Um, someone who goes, I would do anything to get what I want... It's not a person that you shake on and then you pay up front for stuff. But um, as the episode rolls on, Elliot gets his upfront payment in terms of his, his daughter speaking. So we kind of go on with it. Um, you thought she was going to be important, didn't you? And then she wasn't. Um, so it this feels like the, the part... Getting Detective Ortega in here feels like the part of the story where the um, uh, where the storyteller has to get all of the players together, even though they have vastly different character builds and backgrounds. So they're just like, and then you were all in the same place together, yay! Um, so there's this guy who sells candy, I guess, and who. Um, well, no one needs malted milk balls, buddy. So, I you know they talk to each other, and he's like, "Hey, you suck." So we understand this guy's stock is pretty low. Again, throwing Elliot under the bus, and um, <laughs> uh, at least Elliot has a nice moment. And I guess he just leaves this candy store unattended. I don't know. It's like a candy store in the Valley of the Kids. But whatever, I assume that this place isn't a completely lawless uh, hellscape. The man just has fuzzy pants instead of... Um, not, not jumpsuit pants, sweatpants. There we go. Fascinating shirt. Uh, so then we have the... Kovacs ends up, ends up taking his gun, and it's the first gun he's shown. And I guess I don't want like a long like gun sequence where you know we go through like 20 different future guns um it's like it's guns though like how complicated are they 
I like that. I mean, I don't know why he acts so impulsively here. I like that Kovacs and Elliot both respond pretty quickly to it. Um, a single weird shot reloading Sabor. My my understanding of flechettes is that they are mini small metal things or plastic things. Um, and the notion that uh, you have a big one and then you just pull it back is super weird. Um, like I don't you just shoot and then you're like hold on and then you get it back and then we got knives which is this is kind of our basic James Bond um, equipment gearing upping episode although I think it's worth noting that well is is Elliot's gun and knife the one that we use for this episode do we just not use the the stupid flechette gun in this episode. So, anyway, I like the little gun. It's small, it's compact. It gives us an excuse for, um, uh, flashback. Where What's Your Name does cool stuff. And it's like, you guys are just live firing out here? Like, it's cool, but, um, it's a bit much. Like, really? It's a cool reveal where she catches the knife. Ooh. But, um... So she takes out two guys at once and then gives him a fucking very important lesson about teamwork. This woman has the freaking broken Aesop's of a Saturday morning cartoon. It's like, I kicked both your asses at once. Why? Because I have a pack of people behind me. It's like, oh, so, what? Like, un undeniably, she's badass. But she's definitely transcending the cool level of of what you expect. We've said envoys are badass. Like, that's cool. Um, but they're not, like, all powerful. They're just incredibly skilled people. So... Which I've I've appreciated and that has been very grounded. But then she goes around like with guys shooting at her with live ammunition. Um, surrounded by other envoys, by the way. Just a guy shooting guns and missing and just bullets go nowhere. And then a guy throws a knife and she catches it without looking. And... I just think that a gun is better than no gun. I just think that... You know, it's like if she's body armor doesn't matter and then punches the dude's chest in. Like, no, no body armor matters. Guns are good. Um, like, I, I can understand the abject lesson of, um, yeah, envoyness is sweet. And in some situations, it can totally, totally outweigh guns. But, uh, not always. Um... <laughs> I I like that it does explain, however, without basis, his fascination with with Elliot and with Gun Guy, where, um, you know, we understand that Kovacs, as a completely amoral person, wants to reestablish his envoy, an envoy type structure to fuck with this power structure, however he wants. So, once we understand that he's committed to that, which is kind of the reason he didn't go back on ice in the first one, is so he can re-up the envoyness and begin putting together a new, a new crew to upend the social order, something which is going to be less clever than leverage, um, and less impactful, I feel, than the guys from Fight Club, than, was it the Mayhem organization in Fight Club? Anyway. I like the explanation. I like that they're explaining to that that she's actually a tenant here and not um, a patient that Poe considers her to be a tenant of the hotel. Mm. Excuse me. So, um, so despite Kovacs' insistence here and Elliot's reassurance, we kind of know. So if that's like level 200, what are like levels 198 through 
you know, 12. I, I also kind of protest the fact that Kovacs is from our future, uh, and yet he wears modern stuff. So these people are all um, wearing white and silver and very pure future colors. And uh, <laughs> um, and he's wearing black with a, a fairly modern suit and tie sort of dealio. It's, um, I guess he's got that, that future collar, which we should just start wearing those. We should just take the initiative and just be like, no more regular collars. Everyone gets the future priesty collars. Just get it done with and ruin that fashion for science fiction forever. So how did they get him in here as a waiter? Like, can you just, are you just, are there just like freelance waiters <laughs> who are just on uh, motherfucking uh, Elance or whatever? And they're just like, hey, I'm a freelance waiter. I've waited over 200 events with like a point zero zero one spill ratio and fucking gregarious factor of seven. Hire me. Like, does Poe just hack the computer? Anyway, um, anyway, so, um, so yeah, I thought for a second that she was going to subvert this, you know, they banged a drama, Bancroft's wife, and uh, fucking Kovacs are like, oh god, they fucking watched this fucking the last episode. And she's like, mm, did they? Mm, fascinating. Mm, cool. I'm like, good. Yeah, because it's a stupid, stupid waste of drama and who gives a shit. And, um, fuck this. But then later we learn that, nope, it's still a big deal and we should fucking care about it. Although we won't fucking care about it because who gives a fucking fuck about it. Right, yes, so. Uh, Bancroft is basically just uh, an NPC giving out quests where he's like, meet me in the upper layer. And then, like, the camera focuses on her and you're like, oh no, we're gonna start doing other things. So I thought he wasn't going to, to do this. Or maybe they're doing something like the thing that he said that he wasn't going to do. Or maybe he's doing it anyway. Um, the obscured windows work for the police station. Um, and it means that you don't have to put a little picture outside of the window on your, your TV show set. Um, but, like, it, I don't know if it works quite so well for Bancroft's house, which is supposed to be nice and glorious. You get the stained glass over there, but, like, this, this is just, like, painted smoky glass with shit in front of it. It's, like, wood in front of it. Um... I don't know if there's a clear architectural style here. I suppose this is just like a free room where she, um, where they can just set it up for anything. But, yeah, and she's like, the law is you have to get rid of the, um, the ring. And then he's like, what? Uh, no, no, we're married. And she's like, oh, you don't have to get rid of the ring. It'd be fucked up in this bout to the death. And then one of them gets a better sleeve and one of them gets a worse sleeve every time. Which is fascinating because like what are the even the numbers on that? Um and then like we do get a little bit here where Ortega and Kovacs are like on the same page. Which doesn't stand to either of them in good stead. They just make each other less likable. Um since she, like, cut up a girl for religious or non-religious reasons in the last episode. And Kovacs is becoming more of a sociopathic asshole by the episode. So, it's like, you guys should totally become friends and not stand each other while you do shitty things. Um, but no, like, she's like, oh, we're married. And, and Ortega's like, oh, God, your children don't like that. Uh, okay, all right, bye. And it's like, no, you're here for the law and the ring, and you should totally call up the bat if they can't do the ring. Or, you know, do whatever. Um, right, so, so, so the fighters, like, they trade up and down sleeves as, I guess, a way to keep them paired? 
I don't know how many of these fights they do. Um, I absolutely love this tiger. Again, if you can just clone shit, like, whatever, eat anything. Eat any endangered species. And they're like, hey, look, the cost you paid to uh, eat this tiger, um, to clone and eat this tiger, is the same as the cost to clone two baby tigers to help repopulate them in the wild. Um, I mean, yeah. Um... I think maybe it's supposed to be a thing because tigers are endangered, but eh, whatever. So he does a little side quest. He shows up to get his, his new quest. Um, I mean, every every conversation with Bancroft is a little frustrating because Bancroft's an idiot who doesn't know what he wants. Um, you know, they've hedged around this where Bancroft kind of wants... Kovacs because he's an envoy and not for his skills as a detective because why else would he want Kovacs? Um, as, as anything other than an expensive novelty. So, um, so I mean, we finally get kind of the core of that in this episode. But Bancroft isn't at all focused on this murder despite all of his posturing. So, um, and then Bancroft's like, no, my son sucks, everybody sucks, and then he's kind of amazed at Takashi's, at Kovacs's, um, attitude, and he's like, what, do you believe that people have a natural lifespan, a beginning, a middle, and an end to our lives, like some kind of story? What are you, Catholic? And I'm not even going to dignify neo-Catholic as one of those new pronouns, new proper nouns that we have to fucking drink for because it's so fucking pointless and lazy. I, you could just leave that as being Catholic. Like, what, what are you, Catholic? <laughs> and it's like, that works with everything doesn't have to be a new version of what was, okay? Like, I get it. So then here's like the pitch right across the plate to make, I don't know, conservatives angry? Like, and and we begin to see that this series is just gonna make our Met, our Methuselahs into like stock idiot bad guys. So we get a couple of scenes. Oh, by the way, he never gave um, dude here that list of people he was talking about. He's just like, I'm God now. Like, okay, did you bring me up here to share a list of suspects? Like, I mean, whatever, man. So, um... And he tries to just, like, the worst chatting people up. Maybe, maybe your lone survivor, sullen, antisocial, misanthropic character, um, terrorist dude, isn't your number one chat people up at a party investigator. Um... We get a little bit of, we get a few hints of the larger implications of Methuselah dying. Um, because they're this completely safe, sheltered sort of um, community that exists literally above other humans. Aha! Mustache watcher! Um, at least finally these people are fucking aware of him. And then we do the half thing, and then, ooh, don't see nobody. Um... It would be hilarious if Bancroft was like a nobody in the Methuselah scene, where they're like, Bancroft, what a bitch. I mean, yeah, he's a Methuselah, but... Nah, nah, nah. So, I mean, he only has one last envoy. Dude, we've copied that guy like a million times. So, we're gonna, we're gonna come up to a scene which doesn't mean much of anything. Uh, I just... I, I don't know why Elliot is here as a waiter and not as a date because it's a lot easier to get him in here. Um, and I just, I don't know why, why he has to be a waiter. Um, I mean, it works a little bit later, but I don't know. I don't, I don't get so much that he does, uh, 
he just immediately mentions that he had sex with what's her name with Ortega and he's like oh no it's super important that Bancroft not learn about this infidelity thing and and then he's like hey Ortega I fucked I fucked what's her name I fucked Bancroft and Ortega's like that's cool how are you this worried about your sex tape and still this bad at keeping a secret and just uh I don't know. I'm just incredibly sad about this. I just, I'm just not feeling it, you know? Um, and then, like, even the shitty, the secret door is so shit. Like, no, don't, don't get me wrong here. Okay, so this guy, like, buys clones of dead terrorists, <laughs> which is going to have a clear social implication later in the series. When Kovac starts blowing up buildings like Tyler Durden. Um, but. Like. So there's a secret door. Or whatever. To a fuck palace. And. They they borrow each other's sleeves. And he has like. I, I, for, I keep forgetting the lady that runs the envoy's name. Um, and. Everything here is, like, so rich slash gaudy. But then he buys a secret door, and it fucking puts gouges in his floor? Are the wood panels not, like, wood from the last oak tree in Georgia? And then, like, they were lacquered with the blood of orphans that no longer exist. I just... <laughs> and it's like, nah, but if that door just totally gouged my floors out, that's cool. Like... It's suddenly so shitty and lived in for all of the work that, um, you guys are getting triggered by fucking samurai jokes when he's just, he's just stupid beyond comparison. This is the episode where the Methuselahs become stupid beyond comparison. Um, so we talk about the Japanese deal again, which is like fascinating. Um... Anyway, and I think he has a boyfriend. I think it's implied that he has a boyfriend here. So here's your one gay character. A drunken man-child. Son of the bad guy. Ooh. I think... I wonder if he's... I know it's been ten years, but I wonder if he's the same kid as the one from The Punisher. The one that died on the docks in the opening scene. That makes John Travolta want to kill The Punisher. Anyway. What I'm talking about? I'm talking about how shitty that secret door is. It gouges the hardwood. Anyway, we finally get the unsurprising truth behind Kovacs being raised from the dead, which is uh, Bancroft wanted to solve his own suicide. So uh, this lady's like, oh, do you? God, you know it'd be great for that? Guy who loves the envoys? If I were to get the last of the envoys and put him into a cool body... And then you pay me for that. It's a sales job. He's he's sold as an exotic pet. Um, which isn't something I'd really called. I mean, we talked about how bad he was at this job and what a stupid choice he was. Um, and Bancroft's kind of, like, fascination with Kovacs. is like, ooh, we make a meth of you yet. Ooh, you're tough. I'm tough. Ooh, are we just alike? Um, that was under the surface. But now we kind of get it on the head that um, he just, he, he liked the envoys. He wanted a do, guy to do a job. And then, um, therefore, Kovacs was taken off of ice. Um, yes, thank you, Huey Freeman. None of these people give a damn about any life but their own. The folks back in the Tiger is cool. Um because we're getting back to the, the patchwork man, which again is a good setup. It's a good, that's what these people are. They're just ripping flesh off to put it back together. Um, and you know, Bancroft's son's a douchebag. Elliot's going to do his own thing. So, um, and here's them doing like, ooh, it's so illegal. The snake scene, I guess I'm going to call it. 
the scene where I kind of realize that no matter what else happens, these people are just stupid, evil assholes. And everything that happens after this is just stupid, evil assholes being stupid, evil assholes. I, um... I, I just... You know, it's like, okay, Methuselahs are bad. Go, go, go. No no nuance here. Um, I mean, I think she literally says those thoughts don't apply to people like us, which, wow. I mean, okay. I like that we also get the no will bit where, you know, we learn that the motivation isn't money. And then Kovacs is instantly like, yeah, uh, but there are other reasons to do that. So whatever. So this is a knockout knife. It got there was a drug in it, but like, what? So, I don't know, bad guys are evil. But this is the point at which I'm ready to basically go in with Elliot and Poe, the series. Because Elliot's like, okay, so I stabbed you a little bit with a knockout knife. Whatever. Um... Make sure to hydrate and take some analgesics and stuff. And it's like, oh, he's a good guy. So he is making his own move here, which um, I kind of respect. On the other hand, he's totally screwing up Kovac's plan. If you're going to fucking, like, screw someone over, get some trust first. Ugh, boy, there's a problem doing these first things in the morning. So I would just sort of, like, tap out so here it becomes obvious that you're just like a pet it's like well and Kovacs is all like meh oh, I'm just a, a novelty meh 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 and is like oh so shameful you know it's embarrassing to be seen as a thing um he's a thing with full autonomy a pocket full of money and an agenda and I think the classic failure of these cartoon bad guys is that they underestimate people and so obviously he's going to underestimate Kovacs um, because as someone who's just fascinated with the envoys and who doesn't understand Kovacs perspective which I kind of have to assume isn't that different or more nuanced when compared to the perspective of the envoys because it be it would be very hard for the last envoy to have a different set of values than the envoys. So anyway, um, he seems to know nothing of how Kovac sees the world, despite having a fascination for these guys. Um, so we're gonna do this, which is just great. Um, so I guess this is her again, or maybe it's not her, because we don't know anymore. So what does this character interaction mean? Um, where is the real Miriam? Uh, or is she just, like, does any of that matter? Do Where are these characters at? Are we supposed to just make assumptions based on little looks and cuts and um, crap like that? Um, I just, <laughs> like, I get it. Lives are commodities. Here's a zero G fight where people fight to the death. I just, yeah, I get it. It's, it's happening. Um, I would much rather see Poe and Elliot solving things and then like, you get these people are bad and the, the not the envoys, the, Methuselahs are jerks. So. I guess their payment is contingent on killing each other. Takashi, you gotta learn to fucking walk away sometimes. You just have to learn to. I guess this is like his child abuse thing. That they're married and he's he's beating her. Like Takashi just. Like you gotta walk away from a situation is what's important. And Bancroft is just like, what? Murder death thing. So. And people are immediately down for it. Because they're evil. 
you know, it's a slightly competent fight scene. I feel like there are a couple times here where, even though they're in zero G, like there's action, and the the reaction doesn't happen because actually it's, you know, shot from the ground up on, um, on an actual even footing. But they do it mostly good. I don't know. I don't know if I should give these guys partial credit when the storytelling isn't. Where does he leverage around like that? Because he can't. He can only pull it from the guy's forward momentum. So he can get that. And then he has to pull it inward. Um, which means he can roll himself around that dude. But he can't really get the the leverage to spin the guy in a U UE. Um because zero g gravity is a little um, free floating zero g combat is less dynamic, and then also that doesn't get slower because it's in zero g. Zero g doesn't mean slow; it just means that it's harder to work with. Um, there's nothing to push off of. So the deal is, is that. Um, <laughs> I like she's not even like oh is that an assassination attempt ah it's a gun whatever I'll take it and then they blow up the monitor and stop the computer for reasons which isn't the best way to stop that because you notice how there's a giant hole beside them and they just all conveniently fall on the edge I, I again it's a decent fascinating fight scene and she's just like, oh no, here are the consequences of your actions. So, um, it's not going to help her standing at all. Um, and what are her stakes here exactly? She seems to have a more compassionate view of these things, obviously, than the meths. But, um, the meths just change the rules, whatever, to amuse themselves. And then... And then he has to just hold them to their word in view of each other to make them behave. Um, I don't know what Ortega's stakes are here. I mean, if Kovacs dies, that's good for her, right? So she could just let him die, but she doesn't because he's the protagonist. And she's a member of the party, even though her character's background doesn't work for it. She has like a huge laceration on his back. And again, up to a certain point, um, this has all been pretty well grounded. But whereas Zero G Lady could have like slit his throat, because <laughs> she had him completely by surprise. She just cuts up his back a lot because who, who gives a fuck? I mean, she could have grabbed his hair and then used that leverage to jam it into his heart from behind. Wouldn't be hard to do. Got ribs back there. I mean, for just that kind of a reason. But, um... And then we get this bullshit. I'm the 100, I'm 100 years old excuse for a thousand year old gender double standards and screwing around. But, uh... Just so stupid, you know. And then zero G fight scenes are cool if you have space to work with and walls to push off of, right? Um, like a scrum, like what they have is interesting. Um, but I don't think I don't, know, I don't feel like I feel like the idea of the zero G fight was much bigger than the actual execution of it. Um, maybe I'm being hypercritical. So then here all of our player player characters get together to compare notes. Um, and so he does his alternate thing, completely screws over Kovacs, who again, that looked like it was deeper than a flesh wound. Like, it should probably still be bleeding. Bleeding blood in a bad way. But whatever, we assume either it was a flesh wound or he patched it up, even though it doesn't look like it's patched up. But really still, how did they get Elliot in there? How... Was he... I don't know, whatever. I guess Poe hacked it. Sure, why not? Um, 
Yeah. I mean, Ortega did actually save his save his ass. So, but don't know why. Have no idea why she saved him. Um, if you know, tweet at Van Velding. I don't know. I don't know why she saved him or why she would. Why she give a shit? So, I mean, you know, he's a murder terrorist who's solving a stupid murder of an idiot, and then the uh, you know those married couples. I mean, they're actually likable. You know, you're rooting for them. So, all right, and we are back here, and. You know, I was looking forward to just her turning up dead, Alice. I'm like, oh, come on. Because that was my bet for the last episode. Just bam. You know, oh, she dead because she talked too much. But now she's stumbling around. You're like, what? Oh, no. She got beat up for helping him last time. So. And then you got those finely tuned envoy senses that see things happen before they happen. For example, things like stab it in the neck, dart in the neck. There we are. Oh, oh, that's a lot of it. So, um, oh no, it's a giant thing. Maybe he'll get a new sleeve. That'd be nice. That'd be a nice twist. Um, so it's like, is there no security at this place? It's fucking... Mohawk and Bane over here doing a thing. So I guess Bane's going to stick around. He's not just some disposable. Aha. And I was, I was right. I'm going to call that a me being right about Alice getting killed. Um, because uh, she was screwed. She was screwed as soon as, as soon as she ended up in this because of whatever idiot conspiracy is happening here. Um, so he puts his Oni down, I guess, so that, um, if something were to happen to his memory, his visual tracking of what would happen could be recovered by going to the whorehouse. Um, although you'd think they'd clean that place, but whatever. Maybe he'll go to the lost and found. Hey, I've lost an Oni. I'm like, oh, this stupid computer that we all have that does nothing. All right. Well, not, not that it's nothing, but which is worth nothing because it's so common and cheap. You just fish it out of the garbage for him. There's like 12 Onis. So they're going to take him to a lab instead of just murdering him. I don't know why they need him alive and in his sleeve. It would be cool if he just wakes up 200 years later and it's a completely different show. Um, that's a really weird syringe. Um... Oh, but weekly assassination attempt, I guess. So, um, so yeah, we're good with that. Oh man, cannot wait to get this series over with. Um, because the right thing to do would just be to kill his body, right? And then it would be to spin up his brain into a virtual, obviously fake VR sim and try to get information from him that way. Um, because whatever seems to be going on with Bancroft, I joke about like being murdered by his kids or suicide. Um, like that does seem to be serious enough to send killers after him. Um, it's just that no one knows or cares about that shit. So, um, I mean, really, literally no one cares. Um, Bancroft, uh, treats this as a hobby. Um, he didn't hire a professional. Um, they got to be harder boiled detectives of the future. Um, Kovacs is just, it's a cover for him to restore the envoys. Elliot's way for him to get his daughter back. Everyone else in Bancroft Circle thinks it's fun. Ortega has some personal vendetta. No one cares about the main plot of this story. And the main plot of the story is like, oh god, we got to do something about Kovacs, man. He's going to fucking solve this shit any second. And cover. Like, I don't fucking give a shit, dude. I'm just collecting my paycheck until he shuts the project down. Um, I mean, one of Kovacs' um, big goals should be to get himself re-sleeved with like a new identity as soon as possible. Um, as soon as he takes everything he can from Bancroft, um, which should involve him using Bancroft money to invest in more than just a couple of guns. Um, it doesn't matter. 
so anyway fuck this show i'll see you next time